Okay, guys. So like I mentioned, we're going to kind of get into um, some, some kind of unique relationship to the PC, right? So again, the truth resists simplicity, right? So I like this kind of uh, this little meme here from Lord of the Rings, right? From Baromir. It's, it's not so simple, right? So the obesity paradox um, is a topic that's kind of been brought up recently when we start getting into conversations about fitness versus fatness or being metabolically healthy and, or metabolically healthy obesity and what that even means. So although, as we know, obesity, right, strongly associated with cardiovascular risk factors, hypertension, heart disease, right? Um, we look at large epidemiological studies, there is a, a paradoxical relationship between obesity and mortality in patients with uh, cardiac disease and heart failure. Um, we, we think this may be due um, to an inaccurate diagnosis of obesity, maybe just using body mass index alone. But the, the, you know, again, the relationship's been shown a few different times, again, that you know, these individuals with heart disease, with heart failure, um, when they, you know, when we look at mortality compared to normal or lean or normal weight individuals, their, their mortality, their survivorship tends to favor those obese individuals. And we're not really, you know, when it was first released over a decade ago, we weren't really sure why. And we'll kind of unpack this relationship. So again, we think it may be just due to inaccurate diagnoses because, you know, BMI alone doesn't tell you exactly where that adipose tissue, or, or just where their body mass is falling, right? Um, again, we talked about location kind of matters. Um, we think, you know, if we define obesity by other standards, including percentage body fat, which is not always readily available in the clinic, waist circumference, which is, we'll get into that, we think that can kind of help give a more, more realistic um, or more accurate depiction of, again, their, 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 um, where they're carrying their weight. And we also think there are conditions of sarcopenic obesity, right? So, um, you know, where people, um, you know, where, where lean mass really may, may matter almost more than just absolute weight, right? So, again, we talked about this as well, that there, there's a lot more than just accumulation of fat and the adipose tissue as well has other, other impacts. But again, there's this unique relationship and we'll, we'll talk about it, right? So uh, this all goes back to a study uh, published by Chip, uh, uh, Chip Lavi. Um, who's down in uh, New Orleans at Oshner Health, a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant scientist and clinician. Um, he looked at the mortality rates of uh, individuals with heart disease who were enrolled um, in a cardiac rehab program. So he had great data of all these individuals. They were all men. Um, and they looked at their mortality profiles, right? Um, and they all of them had just completed a three-month program of exercise training. So these are all men who went through cardiac rehab. They had coronary artery disease and were comparing, you know, amongst body weight. Now, um, the overweight and obese patients, if we went by BMI alone, had a worse cardiovascular disease profile too, um, but had considerably lower overall mortality at the third year follow-up compared to individuals with a normal or lower body weight, right? Even if we, and we break it down by body fat distribution, um, patients, again, still had this lower mortality. And probably importantly from that study, that purposeful weight loss, right, didn't cause harm. So, right, we saw this relationship epidemiologically, you know, larger or obese individuals had lower mortality, but if they lost weight, it didn't like make it worse, right? So it makes you start thinking, you know, or at least not a statistically, you know, insignificant reduction in mortality, right? I mean, they got improved coronary risk factors, but nothing changed really with mortality. So it makes you think, um, you know, what's kind of going on here, right? Because they, you know, we see this relationship, they lost some weight, didn't cause harm, you know, didn't really do much to change mortality, but their coronary risk profile got better. And here's a kind of a graph from that from that study showing again, um, you know, this this mortality risk it was higher in these lower, um, you know, normal body weight individuals. Now, we think that this may be due to a lot of different factors, but when we start going through the data, um, there were studies, you know, came out later looking at this. Um, apologies for the dogs barking in the background. When we look at fitness, right? So individuals with high fitness 
all calls and cardiac mortality risk across BMI categories, right? They had high fitness, their mortality was lower, and that relationship didn't change whether or not you know, they were in a different you know, classification of obesity or not obese, right? Um, and that you know, if you had lower fitness, irrespective of your BMI, your mortality, right? Um, if your low, if fitness was lower, we're talking about VO2 max, cardiovascular fitness, if that was lower, right, your mortality risk went up, right, went higher. Now, so we think um, that perhaps this relationship was really more fitness, um, you know, that again, and if we stratify people by fitness, right, the, the relationship with BMI and body weight kind of neutralizes. We also think that perhaps the individuals with normal weight that develop heart disease, right? Obesity isn't the driving factor for them having heart disease. Maybe there's a genetic factor that they produce more cholesterol. They're higher prone to developing clots. I've had patients before um, that I saw in residency who had to get a heart transplant. They were in their you know, early or mid thirties, lean, very lean. But by the time they were, I think like 30, you know, again, mid thirties, they had multiple stents, multiple bypasses. They smoked a little bit, weren't the most healthy in terms of stress balance with their job, but like, you know, obesity wasn't a driving factor. And there are patients that fall into that criteria. So again, you know, BMI um, in individuals with coronary artery disease, it's a little bit more complex. Uh, but again, when we start looking at fitness, right? how well you're able to tolerate exercise, how, how hard you can work and how hard your body can tolerate the stress of, of, of exercise, especially at high intensities, right? That neutralizes the obesity paradox. So, so perhaps our strategy for patients with obesity, right, should really be more focusing on other goals be, beyond just weight loss, focusing on fitness, focusing on proving lean muscle mass, maybe shifting that balance between adipose tissue and muscle tissue, which we know, you know, again, these things are always in balance. And in obesity, we see a favoring more towards more too much adipose tissue and not enough muscle. Maybe if we do things to improve muscle mass, right, in these individuals, things may work out a little bit better. So overall, again, the, the focus should be on fitness, focus on fitness. And again, I go back to this, this fantastic graph, which is adapted from Jonathan Meyer's, um, you know, uh, seminal paper published in uh, the journal of medicine in 2002, which looked at um, multiple different conditions, hypertension, COPD, diabetes, smoking, BMI over 30, hypercholesteremia, you know, you know, uh, increasing fitness by one met was associated with, a, you know, 13% reduction in mortality, independent of diagnosis. And this is true, again, for obesity. Um, it was true in this study, and it's true now that there are things that we can do to improve your health, improve your, your, your survival ship, if we can get you a little bit more fit, even if you don't, you know, lose a lot of weight, there's other things that we can still do for, for obese patients. And again, we'll kind of get into, you know, uh, more reliable measures, uh, ways to measure obesity. Again, waist circumference, hip to waist. BMI gets a lot of flack. BMI is not the worst measure. And for most individuals, um, you know, the argument we get is, well, you know, a football player, right, could, ha could be technically overweight or obese um, you know, by their BMI, but they're actually kind of healthy because they just have a lot of muscle mass. Now, that's pretty rare. Uh, and typically, when we go into BMIs over 40, when we're in like severe obesity or class two obesity um, or class three obesity, uh, that like that's probably not muscle mass, right? Um, and especially when we're talking about you know BMI is a fifty, you know, you know the populations I treat, BMI is actually a pretty pretty accurate measure. So again, there's limitations to it. It works very well across the population, but in, at the individual level, BMI might be a little bit limited. But again, you know, caveat. You know, if you start going above a BMI of 40, that's that's probably not muscle mass. And at least it's not something you did without maybe using uh, steroids, actually. So, um, but there are uh, ways to get a little bit more or better resolution image, and that could be just a simple waist circumference measure, hip to waist. So, um, you know, again, there's, you know, there's you know, weight measurements, uh, height measurements, um, hip and waist circumference measurements uh, that we can utilize, uh, body fat distribution, 
looking again at a DEXA maybe or MRI, there's ways to be very, very accurate. Um, so again, not everyone's going to have access to a DEXA. Not everyone's going to have access to a BOD pod. Not everyone's going to have access um, to underwater weighing or biological impedance, right, which can also be impacted by a lot of other different, um, a lot of other different uh, factors, right? If you're, you know, overhydrated, underhydrated, right? You know, fat tissue um, has more impedance electrical flow. So if you're dehydrated, that's going to affect um, how well or how accurate biological impedance analysis will be. So you can, just a simple hip and waist circumference measurement, we're finding that that in combination with obesity is actually pretty, pretty accurate of how, how healthy someone is in terms of how much weight they're carrying. So there's two different protocols you can follow, one from the World Health Organization, one from the NIH. Um, the biggest thing is just keep with one um, and, and be consistent. And so the WHO measures you know, the midpoint between the lower uh, rib and the iliac crest. NIH protocol you know, may the level of the umbilicus or navel. This is a little bit limited because um, patients with who are you know, class two or class three obesity or above, they have a large panis, their belly button begins to to move, it, drip, it, it droops. Um, so you, you, you gotta probably need to go by more of the anatomical region. But again, just be, just be consistent. Um, you need a standard um, with each patient document. And then hip should always be taken out of the widest portion. And we, we cover this in health promotion. Um, here are our cutoff scores again, um, looking at, um, again, circumference of these areas. Uh, skin fold measurements can also be used. Um, you know, these are using a standardized caliper and we're measuring a thickness, right, of, of, of skin folds. And that gives a reflection of how much subcutaneous or how much adipose tissue is located there. And we, we take it over standardized locations. Uh, there's equations that we can uh, put into it. There's two traditional methods, the ACSM method, traditional method. Um, and then you're going to go around to these different locations. We have them listed here, uh, the triceps, the chest, mid-axillary, subscapular, superiliac, abdominal, and thigh. Um, there's also the really basic three site measurement um, where you're going to be measuring just chest, abdomen, thigh for men and women, triceps, super ilium, and, and then the thigh. Um, so there are ways to be a little bit more specific in measuring adiposticity, right? How much fat tissue we're carrying um, beyond just looking at BMI. But again, you know, BMI by itself, not too bad because again, if you go beyond 40, that's probably not muscle mass, unless you're taking anabolic steroids, like your body just won't carry that much muscle tissue unless you give it a little bit of help. Um, and, uh, you know, we combine BMI with waist circumference, we get a pretty good resolution image. And again, these are our uh, uh, calculations here for um, uh, body composition. And then here's some standardized um, uh, value. So I'm not expecting you guys to just know these off, you know, remem memorize these. These are just for reference. Uh, but again, remembering that you need, you should be carrying a little bit of, of fat on you. Again, we need, we need body weight. Um, indeed, we need, we need body fat for a lot of different uh, regulatory functions in our body. So um, that's the end of this unit. And then uh, next we'll get into interventions uh, to manage obesity and some rehab considerations.